get here. But I was there in front of the camera here with this shiny spot. Yeah, it's it's well, it's it's kind of flaring, but it is okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Let's have a word of prayer. We'll get started. Thank you, Lord, that we can be together tonight. We ask that you bless as we discuss this very difficult topic. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be able to help those who are contemplating this. So give us wisdom, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I was going to take the first part tonight, but uh, let me just mention to you, years ago, there was a young lady in her church that uh, she got involved somehow. Well, come in, come in. We're just glad that you're well enough to be back with us. See you. The, uh, this young lady she, um, I, I don't know how uh, or who, who this was but she became pregnant uh, she was thinking very seriously about an abortion and so um, we talked with her do you understand what this means? What this does? Do you, do you really? Is this what you want to do? Or are you going to go ahead? And try to share with her the principles of God's word, and that this was not pleasing to him to go this direction. And she's one of the few people that ever responded to that. She decided to keep the baby, and uh, one of the young men in our church, uh, they got married. And uh, he was he was pleased to to know her. He was not the father, but uh, they got married, and he adopted the girl. And uh, we saw her years later. She was in college at the time, young lady, and it's just a, a beautiful thing. There, her life was spared because her mother decided to do the right thing. And what we want to try to do is to help you think tonight about what abortion is and why it is so uh, repugnant to God and how we can communicate this to friends and children, neighbors, whatever, so that we can have an impact. So, uh, Marla, if you come and share your part. Yes, I did. Yes. I did. I <laughs> did. Might be trouble. <laughs> Could be. I'm getting old. I was on the phone with a lady from the church last week and I prayed with her and we talked for a few minutes and then I said, Would you like me to pray for you? <laughs> and she said, Yes. And I started praying. I thought, I think I already did this. And so it was brief. And I said, Did I already pray for you? She said, Yes. But it's okay if you want to pray twice. <laughs> Anyways, this subject matter is, um, I don't like speaking about it, to be honest with you, but um, last, uh, 2018, we were going to Ireland, and Ireland had just legalized abortion, and uh, the counselors over there were asking for information on how to counsel the subject, and um so I did a lot of research for them, and um, it still gives me um, a stomach ache to, to um, talk about it, and uh, it's not a fun subject, but it's essential, especially um, as we see the days getting darker. Well, on January 22nd of this year marks a very sad anniversary. That's when the U.S. Supreme Court made a tragic decision legalizing the deliberate taking of unborn human life through elective abortion, judicial sanction of the termination of life in the womb, seen by many as a right, is really a wrong that for seven, 47 years has coarsened coarsen, right hearts and darkened minds. And today, after more than 60 million, 60 million abortions, Plus, there is less regard for all human life as society discards those deemed to be inconvenient because of age 
infirmity or any other reason. This past year, in one of the most polarized political environments experienced in recent history, we were appalled that some states sought to strengthen the laws that permit abortions even to the moment of birth. We also saw the US Congress fail repeatedly to consider protections that ensure infants who survive abortion to receive proper medical care. Respect for the life, right to life and dignity of every human person, whether he or she is poor, an immigrant, a refugee, incarcerated, infirm, sick, elderly, or unborn, simply reaffirms the self-evident truth that all men are created equal and endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights and thus promotes the more, more perfect union to which our founders aspired. So tonight our purpose for teaching about abortion is motivated not by political, but by biblical principles. Um, long before science, somebody said long before science substantiated the truth that abortion is the painful killing of an innocent human being, the psalmist summarized the view of sacred scripture with these words and you know, very well, Psalm 139, verses 16, 13 through 16. For you created me, my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place and when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So if somebody has said, and you, I'm gonna virtually read your notes because we wanted you to have the information. Um, most of the times if we lecture, we don't give you the details, but on this subject, you will need details if you're gonna be counseling. So this is pretty much, I'm just gonna read what you have in your notes. I may uh, divert from it a little bit, but um, within the, mother's egg cell, a sperm cell penetrates, and it, at, it is at that time that life begins. There's a fantastic book called Beginning Life. The photographs in it are phenomenal. Um, they're inspirational and they're captivating. And um, I have thoroughly enjoyed reading that book several times and the pictures are, are, are amazing. So. Anyways, in this book, it depicts that within hours, a single egg divides into an embryo. The entire genetic blueprint has been set, the determining of the color of the eyes, of the hair, of height, of sex, and even of their little personalities. Within a week's time, the cells divide in an orderly fashion and multiply. At 22 days, and there's some discrepancy to who you read, uh, some have said 18 days, but somewhere between 18 and 22 days, the heart begins to beat at which with a twitch. Um, day 25, the baby's heart becomes a regular beating. And then soon after in the earliest stages of a baby's life, it is vital for them to exercise for the development of muscles and joints. By the fourth month, the baby is very sensitive to the basic noises from its mother. The baby does not sleep and rarely rest for more than six to seven minutes. In suit, inside the womb, the baby becomes familiar with smells, either through the amniotic fluid or the umbilical cord. And the baby has more taste buds before birth than they will have later in life. And having had four children, I can tell you these facts are true. Um, it's also, this is a scientifically pro proven and indisputable fact, according to the worldwide acclaimed gen geneticist, Dr. Jerome. The genie. Well, June. That. She could be. Okay. At the moment of its conception, every chromosome that will determine every genetic trait is present at conception. At 18 days after conception, the excuse me, a baby's heart is strong enough that a sonogram can detect it. The brain and central nervous system are working in the womb, and that's a definite sign of life. So let's just go through what this beast looks like. This horrible thing that we are, have done to these 60 million babies. I, it's very graphic, I apologize. I 
I hope you understand the purpose again is to, so you have the information. So if you're counseling with somebody who wants to have an abortion, you need to have information to explain to them because when, if they go to Planned Parenthood, uh, they're not gonna get this kind of information. So let's talk about the suction abortion. That's when a tiny preborn child is torn limb from limb by a high powered vacuum nearly 30 times as strong as a home vacuum. By the way, that's two thirds of all abortions are done that way. Um, a DNC, the preborn child is literally sliced into pieces by a scalpel. That, this article says abortion is a procedure of the, it has a tiny hoe is used to chop the baby's body to pieces. The body is then scraped off the wall of the uterus and sub subsequently reassembled to ensure that no remaining parts have been left behind. Um, and the reason for that, as you probably already know, is if there are any parts left behind, it'll cause an infection inside the woman's body. The D and E abortion. I wanna read Dr. James Dobson's description. Over two days, the cervix is dilated. Then an ultrasound device and forceps are used to reach in and grab the baby's feet. The little body is pulled downward until just the head remains in the cervix. Next, the abortion grasps the nap of the neck and cuts open the back of the skull with blunt scissors. A, a, a device called a cannula is then inserted into the wound and the brain material is sucked out. If kidneys, listen to this, if kidneys or other organs are desired, they are removed while a child is still partially in the vagina. And initially, at least, these surgical procedures are performed on a live baby who has not specifically been anesthetized, although the mother's medication may reduce the, the, some of the pain. Uh, no comment. I, I, um, <clears throat> let's talk about the saline abortion. The baby is injected with a salt poison that burns his, her body from the outs, inside out over a grueling three-day period before inducing miscarriage, at which time the baby is sometimes still alive and suffering. Very often, the baby um, is a shriveled corpse. Um, partial birth abortion, that is not, actually not a medical term, but it, it is the, the description is the baby is stabbed through the head or the skull is crushed. So the rest of the fetus can be removed more easily through the cervix. Um, these are horrendous procedures that mothers are never told about, never warned about, about the um, side effects, the potential danger, and then they're never told about um, some of the dangers to their own health. So, so let's go through that. Um, first of all, I want to read what Dr. Jean Wright wrote that preborn children have a greater sense of pain than newborns because their nervous systems are just beginning to develop and pain sensors in unborn children produce a greater hormonal stress reaction than in newborns and adults. So let's talk about the medical risk from abortion. Um, and I think I told you before, and when I was working on my master's degree, I had to read um, Randy Elkhorn's book, uh, it's um, pro, pro life answers for pro, pro, pro choice questions. And it is a thick, thick book. I had to put it down every couple of pages. I had to put it down, look up and watch. I had a television going with something I wanted. I was enjoying like a, probably some kind of a, um, food show. I just couldn't stand it. I just hated the book. I did get through it, but it is, if you want to read all about the details, all the political stuff, that's a book you want to read, but it, it'll take you a bit of time. Um, so uh, in his book, Abortion Isn't About Women's Health, or I think that's an article he wrote. It's, he says, it's common to talk to women physically or psychologically damaged by abortions who say, I had no idea this could happen. No one told me about the risks. 
Unfortunately, the large body of evidence indicating significant abortion risk has been suppressed and ignored. This suppression is made possible by pro-choice advocates who zealously oppose any requirements for abortion clinics to provide information. The immunity to stating the facts enjoyed by abortion clinics increases their profits, but only at the expense of women who are not allowed to make an informed choice. I, um, quite a few years ago, I was called by a friend of one of the ladies in our church and she was in her forties and she was a divorcee. She had two um, teenage kids and she had had an affair and gotten herself pregnant and he demanded that she get an abortion. And the friend was over in Aurora and said, I'm concerned she's not answering the phone. Could you go check on her? And I, oh, I thought, I, God, I, I don't want to go check on her, but I need to. So I went to her house and I knocked on the door and nobody came and went in and found her under the kitchen table in a fetal position, just bawling her head out and head off. And uh, we chatted and I tried to explain to her that. God's forgiveness and grace, even in folks. And um, it brought her a measure of comfort. So my heart went out to her. I don't know if she chose her children or not. I didn't take the opportunity to counsel with her again. In fact, I think she was so embarrassed by it, she left the church. Um, she was a school teacher and a uh, very sweet lady. You know, it broke my heart to see her that way. And I think you will be telling more stories. Um, anyways, um, her, we are on page two of the Japanese up. The most single avoidable risk factor for breast cancer is indeed abortion. And I think I've told you this before that a woman who has an abortion increases her risk of breast cancer by a minimum of 50% and as much as 300%. And by the way, they won't tell you that in Planned Parenthood. And in fact, at one point, the um, National Cancer Society would not acknowledge it. And I don't know where they are on that. I haven't tracked it. But when I was reading that book by Randy Alcorn, at that point, they hadn't acknowledged it. Uh, the other uh, risk factor is it, in, it in, it's, uh, increases the risk for future miscarriages. Many studies have demonstrated a, a statistically significant increase in miscarriage. Premature, premature births or low birth rate risk in women with prior induced abortions. Low birth weight and premature birth are the most important risk factors for infant mortality or late disabilities, as well as for lower cognitive abilities and great, greater behavioral problems. I am, um, we have a friend who started a ministry for post-abortion. We'll be talking more about her next week when we deal with post-abortion counseling. And um, she was, I think she was 18 and um, she got pregnant and she had an abortion and um, was never ever able to have a child after the abortion. But in God's grace, 30 years to the day that she had that abortion, she was flying out of New York City over to Kiev, uh, Ukraine, to open up a, a counseling clinic for young women having abortions. And she developed some wonderful Bible studies. And um, so we've, we've been, I, I see her on Facebook and I, right now I'm gonna chat with her. But um, anyways, so all that to say, God can use the worst situation in our life and still let us minister to people. He did it throughout scripture. <laughs> Look at all the people in scripture who blew up big time. They didn't necessarily do this, but they did horrific things and God still used them so okay the next point is the pro-choice um did I read that pro-choice voice claims that the right of a woman to have an abortion is a woman's health issue and that Planned Parenthood is about women's health 
These claims couldn't be further from the truth. Pregnancy is not a disease that needs to be treated or cured. It is not healthy for a woman to have an abortion. In fact, having an abortion dramatically increases a woman's risk of major depression and suicidal tendency, and it also increases the risk of breast cancer and future miscarriages. Let me just comment quickly. Forgive me that it's too graphic, but when a mother gets pregnant, her breasts begin to develop to be nursing. And when, when there's an abrupt um, abortion, the body does not know how to take care of itself. If there is a miscarriage, God has created within the body a way to correct and heal itself. But So that's why there is a difference between a miscarriage and, a, and a, an abortion is because God created a way for the mother to heal. But um, we're, we're messing with God's creation here. So I think I have done my nasty duty. Is that awful? I just hate talking about this. I don't like, it, but I, I understand it's, and I agreed to do it. And, and but that gets the good part. Now he gets to tell you God's word and how to help them. And so um, please, I, I, uh, I hope none of this material was offensive to you. However, if you're going to be counseling young women and young men, by the way, young men, they need to hear the details of what their decision is going to encounter. We can't just brush over the subject. And um, so that's why we've been very upfront with you and giving you the details as gross as they are. So you will be prepared. So it's all yours, baby. I'm glad I'm done. And I'm going to sit down. Well, one of the things that we have discovered is that so many people in the church won't deal with this and people have come in for counseling about this because of the embarrassment the sense of failure the sense of condemnation guilt all of these things and they're far more likely to go to Planned Parenthood or someone like that that will only say it's your right and you're okay to do this nothing wrong with this trying to tell them that this is not real life that they're not human beings yet it's just the fact is, everyone knows these are human beings. They already know this. And uh, I was uh, debating an evolutionist one time. He and I were talking about this issue. And he said, you know, it's, it's time to just admit, of course, these are human beings. But sometimes people have to die in order for the greater good, you know. And he was very heartless about it. You just, it's a baby, just sometimes it's not convenient. You got to kill them. Well, at least he was being honest that it's a baby. And I just, I find the hypocrisy of the medical industry with this and these doctors who are willing to kill a baby. And even after the birth, after the birth and the child is viable, the child can live, there are doctors willing to kill that baby right there on the table. And I'm telling you, they are going to face a holy and righteous and angry God about that. How God allows that to, uh, for those people to continue, I don't know. It's God is sovereign. The only comfort I have about abortion is that I truly believe that these little babies are in heaven because they did not have any opportunity to choose right or wrong totally innocent and I know that God is a loving and righteous God who uh, I do not believe he would allow a child who's never made a choice to sin never made a choice to reject God I don't I do not believe that he's going to allow them to be in hell I believe they will be in heaven and that comforts me because some of these children growing up in godless homes would not have been in heaven Nonetheless, that's not a good reason to go ahead and say, well, let's kill kids. It's, it's just, it's a tragic thing. And we're just going to look at some passages. There are many passages here for you to look at and to, to examine. And you may look at some and say, I'm not sure how this applies, but think it through carefully. And I think you'll see that some of it applies to the relationship. Some of it applies to, or applies to the men as well as women. But this first part, Marla's already referred to, but I want to go through it again. 
because it's so powerful. Psalm 139, starting in verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. If, if you stop and think about the design of the human body that God has made, it's amazing. I mean, you think about you think about the hands and how God has made them so perfect, you know, to, to be able to manipulate tools and the, to grasp things and also have feelings. I mean, all of these things that go on with, with the hands and then the feet. You look at how as, as God has designed the body, here we are standing, our legs look down straight, and suddenly they curve out, you know, for feet. And you look at that and say, Is it, isn't that amazing how God has put that together, all the bone structure and, and all the ligaments come together to form the body that God has made. And, and he says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I, I just picture David looking at his hands and, and maybe looking at the babies and, and saying, this is amazing how, how beautiful they are, how beautifully built they are. You know, these, all the parts coming together. It's, to me, it's astounding. And he says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And that, that verse is extremely important. Your eyes saw my unformed body. But he refers to himself as a person at that point. He's, he's saying, listen, I was there. I was already there, but my body was not yet formed. Talking about the, the beginning process where you just see the one cell and then the fertilized cell, then two cells and it goes on. What a miracle birth is. It's just, to me, the, the birth process is a beautiful, glorious, only God could think of such a thing. I mean, to put that together. Come in, Daniel. But I, I look at this and I, I just say, how, how beautiful this is. He says, you saw my unformed body. All the days were ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God knows already the uh, plans he has for that life. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Think about this, what this means for you and me. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God knows every day of our life what's mm -hmm. going to happen. He knows the good days. He knows the bad days. He knows what we are going to do with our life. And he knows how long we're going to live. He knows uh, the day that he's going to call us home because we have an appointment with God. It's appointed on the man wants to die and after that, the judgment. But he says, before it even came about, you already knew me. And I look at that and I say, is that not a miracle also? That God knows us before we're even, even born, before we're even conceived. Well, in the, the next part, uh, children are a gift from God. And there are times when our little kids are acting out like little kids. You may not think they're a gift so much at that point, but they are. They're a gift. And they cause joy. They also cause sorrow. But they are they're a gift from God. Children's children are crowned to the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. We, uh, we have 12 grandchildren, and uh, we have uh, some that come over and visit us frequently and it is such a joy to have them walk through the door and to see them and we laugh together and uh, tease each other and it's just it is a joy to be a grandparent and we pray for them because they live in a very wicked world and the uh, pressures to give in to evil are so strong and so we pray for them but he says they're a crown to the aged and we can testify to that for sure. They're a gift from God. And I look at that and I think if, if these young women who maybe they made a mistake, but maybe they're married and it's just inconvenient and they don't want to take the responsibility. I just tell you, they are missing out on such a blessing. We knew some, some people who uh, were now in their oh, 60s or 70s and 
they had never had children. I don't know if they couldn't have them or if they chose not to. But I felt sorry for them that they didn't have that opportunity to have them in their home. We look back on those child rearing days where we had divorces with our kids. And then we would go for walks together. That's one of my favorite things to go out. Uh, we had a canal over by where we lived there in the North Bend. And we'd walk beside that in the evenings. We'd go out there uh, with our dog and uh, the kids, I'd cover the dog's eyes and hold her and the kids would go hide. And then we'd let her go, go where she is. She'd take off and she would run as fast as she could and run around the field out there and find each one of them. What fun that was. It was so much fun to watch them and the, the times where we would discuss God's word with them and all, it's a gift. It's absolutely a gift. The vacations we took with them and uh, just the experience of being there. I, I still have all these memories floating around the times we were with them on vacations. We, uh, one time we gave the kids an opportunity to go to Disneyland or to go visit, uh, I don't what this is. It's, it's not on the um, I don't, don't bother you. Uh, we gave the opportunity to choose Disneyland or to go to Uncle Howard and Aunt Pat's in Michigan. Now, most kids would say, Disneyland, let's go there. That's, it was hands down. I said, Uncle Howard and Aunt Pat's. They lived out in the country and they had this oh, beautiful backyard went down a hill and had a forest behind it. It was great. Uncle Howard would uh, make strawberry pancake breakfasts for them and on, on the fire pit out there, and do it, cook it outdoors. Those are some of the wonderful memories that we had together with them. And just, it's, uh, those are some things that you can't enjoy uh, without children around. Now there, we have a, a family member, um, brother-in-law who, his, he and his wife were not able to have children. And so our kids have adopted them. They adopted them. And they go over, we've got some, some of our grandkids go over and help with the yard, and cleaning up the leaves and, and doing all that because they just, they enjoy them so much. And, and to have them around them is a blessing as a gift from God. It really is. So those of you who have children, you can rejoice in the fact that God's given you a great gift. There are disappointments sometimes as well, of course, but that's part of life. And we learn certain things from the disappointments of life, the pain of life. We, we learn things through that. And we are in touch with a number of parents who have had great pain from their children, but there still is that depth of love that you can experience because of your children. So, Never think that they are, they're not a gift from God. They really are. Uh, then the point C, personhood begins at conception. And there's some who literally try to say, well, there's a day when they become a human being later on. You know, uh, at first, they're not really human. They're just cells. Um, but you look at that and say, really, can you philosophically support such a thing? There's a beginning point, and it's, Nonstop into as they as they grow with their, their bodies continuing on into adulthood. So if if there is a time where they suddenly become human, is there a time when they suddenly are not human? And in our culture today, more and more there is that feeling toward older people that you know you need to you need to give up and get out of the way because you're no longer useful. We need to recognize scientifically. And spiritually, we need to understand they become a person the moment they're conceived. Again, in Jeremiah 1, verse 5, God says to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. He says, I knew you even before. Now, Mormons teach that there are the baby souls already in heaven. And then when there's conception, then God sends these babies down and they become part of the body and all. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. It's not even close. God creates this special soul 
as I've shared before, the reason that God is so concerned about sexual activity is because it is a holy process. It is the one thing that we as human beings can do in cooperation with God to form an eternal soul. That's, that's why it's so important to God and it's so holy. And we just, people just take this like this is just a, a play thing. And, uh, if if uh, we don't get pregnant, then it's no big deal. And if we do, we can take care of it through abortion. And I just, I just want to share with them. Do you realize your parents could have had an abortion? They could have snuffed you out. And there are some who are so cold hearted at this point and say, well, that's, that's their choice. I just, I, I don't know how people can skip over these facts and just go right ahead and do it. Point D, personhood exists in the womb. Uh, from birth, I was cast upon you from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Even, even at that point, uh, he, he's saying that, you know, uh, I believe he's talking about the fact that his family had taught him about God, but he is, he is saying at this point that, You've been my God from the beginning. Do you realize that there are times he is our God without our knowing it? If we're not aware yet of who he is, but he has plans for us, he still is our God. And those who totally disown God, he's still God. And he is their God, though they're not his, because they have chosen to turn away from him. But all of us, uh, we have to admit there comes a time where we, we can say that you have been my God from my mother's womb. Well, point E, rape or incest and abortion. This is a question that comes so many times uh, and people try to justify abortion because a woman was raped and, and my heart goes out to her, frankly. Uh, I, I cannot imagine the, the violation, the terror that takes place in a woman's life when she's raped or when uh, incest takes place and usually there is uh, there's a forced um, relationship at that point uh, but I, I look at this and I I can understand why they say I just don't want to bear this child I just don't want to do that because of the memories of but what we would try to remind everyone is that it's not that baby's fault when, when you talk about an illegitimate child, that's really a long term. No child is illegitimate. Their parents are illegitimate, but not the child. The child is, has every legitimate claim to life and to uh, become a part of our world and to have uh, a lifetime of joy and success and sorrow and failure, all the parts of humanity. But... Uh, because we're trying to be kind to people sometimes. We say, well, it's okay if she doesn't want to keep her baby because of that. And while my sympathy is with her, I still believe that my sympathy should be more with the child at this point. And there are numbers of women, and you can find the stories of uh, women who've been raped but went ahead and kept the child. And we'll talk about the blessing this child is and how thankful she is that she had the child. And also, we have to try to teach them this passage and there are others, of course, in here. We know all that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Who knows what that child might grow up to be? Who knows what, what discovery uh, this child might make? what to medicines that child might develop, what, uh, what a power of evangelism, that child maybe becoming a powerful missionary, a powerful pastor, whatever. But to, to strike out and say, well, I just don't want to, to have this reminder. Just remember that God works all things together. And one of the points of that passage is found in verse 29, where it's, is to conform us to the image of Christ. Come or Christ-like. In all the suffering that Jesus went through, he, he still was willing to allow us to live. And I'm thankful for that. There are some stories in Genesis, of course, Genesis 19, the story of Lot and, and daughters. They, they thought that the world was coming to an end. 
they saw all the area around about them being destroyed in Sodom and Gomorrah. And they thought, I, I think they probably thought this is it. This is the end of the world. We're all going to be destroyed. Uh, they had no way of knowing whether this was hitting other areas around about them in other cities, but they, you could excuse them for thinking that it was all um, coming to an end. And they were thinking that uh, to continue our family, uh, there's no husband for us. And they got a lot drunk and had relations with him and each had children out of this um, or a child out of this. I look at this. And again, you can sit there and go, boy, you can understand what they're thinking. But I look at that and I think uh, these little boys that were born from this were not evil in being born. They, they should not have to suffer the penalty of being born that way. And, and it, we, we find that uh, they became the head of nations. I mean, they, they uh, actually caused some nations to come into being. Uh, in Genesis 38, we find the story of Judah and his daughter-in-law, who uh, he, he was evil. He was an evil, selfish man at this point in his life. God changed, I think, through this situation that God began to change his heart. Because uh, she dressed like a prostitute uh, with a veil over her face, and he came into the town he was visiting and uh, saw her and contracted with her for a uh, relationship. And, and then when he found out later she, she was his daughter-in-law and that she was bearing a child and um, he wanted her executed for this. And I think it's, it's an interesting story as she was being pretty much almost let out for execution. She, she handed the thing that he left as a, as a kind of a token that he would uh, pay the price she had asked. And she said, can if, tell me who this is, because this is the man that got me pregnant. And of course, he recognized his seal and his staff or whatever. And it was at that point, he said, she's more righteous than I. He was convicted of his sin. And I look at that, and as we follow his story, he became the leader of his family to a large extent, um, ex with the exception of, of Joseph, who was actually the one in power over them. But he was very influential and God used Judah to bring about the, the tribes that brought, the, the tribe that brought our Lord Jesus to us. Uh, you know, we can be very uh, critical of these people I want you to understand and remember that they did not have the Bible that we have. They didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit that believers in Christ have. And so when you see the things that they did, God gave them a conscience and they knew right from wrong. And God did judge them on the basis of that and their faith in him. But uh, I, I guess my point is this. When there's someone in our circle of family or community or church or whatever that has a pregnancy and is not married our attitude it it, it is offensive to me that uh, the men can walk away and the women bear the shame it, it's wrong it's something terribly wrong with that and then she has to go through the procedures of birth and all the pain that goes with it and he's out fishing somewhere you know just it's just not right but i i look at these people i would have so much more respect for a, a young man who says look i'm as much to blame as, as she is if not more and takes responsibility for the child and for her uh, you know i have even more respect if he says i want to marry you anyway um, it doesn't happen very often because the guys can just walk away but we need to be very gentle and loving, I believe, toward uh, the people who've made a mistake like this, even to the point that we're gonna talk about post-abortion counseling next week. Uh, how do we comfort someone who's gone through this and now is very repentant? How do we help them to see God's love and God's forgiveness that uh, 
There is no sin that we can commit that's unforgivable in God's eyes, except it talks about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is talking about turning our backs on him and denying him. And uh, because it's the hardening of the heart. But there any other sin that we can possibly commit, God can and will forgive. There are consequences to our sin, but he will forgive, especially if we turn our hearts to him and trust for salvation. Well, God's view of abortion, point F there, just several thoughts on this. He says you should not murder. He authorizes killing in war to protect your family, to protect your nation. And he's not, he's not real pleased with the fact that it needs to be done at times. Imagine if our nation had not gone to war with Hitler. Do you know Hitler's realm was about the size of Montana? That's how big Germany was. And yet he was about to take over the world. And if we'd not had the courage of our soldiers going over there, giving their lives, uh, it would have been a horrible thing. The people that they were killing, not only Jews, but uh, the gypsies, Christians, anyone who would stand up to Hitler was done away with. But war is authorized by God for certain times. But murder is not. And murder is so different. Murder is... Uh, virtually kind of one-on-one -on -one. it's it's because it's done because of convenience done because of hatred you know in war when when guys are shooting one another it's not necessarily that they hate the enemy they just know that if i don't shoot them they're going to shoot me and they're trying to protect themselves and they recognize that the war has to be done do you remember the story of when uh, this is during world war one I, I believe when uh, Christmas Day came and the soldiers came out of the of the uh, trenches, and they they started singing Christmas songs together, and they they walked across the field that they would tomorrow would be shooting at each other again. Uh, it's it's an amazing thing that they they saw the difference between them. But if but if one had just gone over and now shot somebody at that point, I think that would have been murder. If somebody came peacefully. And then somebody else just whips out a gun and shoots him. Um, I think that would be considered murder in God's eyes. He says, this day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. I love that. Choose life. We see that uh, phrase on cars sometimes, you know, bumper sticker, choose life. Well, this is exactly what he's telling us, choose life. But he's saying, choose it for yourself. But I think it can go further than that, that he has set before us life and death. And God has, has made it known through science. He's made it known through his word that these babies are people and we should choose life. I think for us as believers in Christ, there is no option for us. I think we have to be on the side of life. And I, I don't see how you can be a believer in Jesus Christ and a believer in the word of God and be favorable toward abortion. I just don't understand how that can be. So I'm pretty uh, pretty determined on that. Six things that are that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. We know what it's talking about, innocent blood, but honestly, what could be more innocent than a baby? Abortion doctors, I just... I don't know how they sleep at night. I, I truly do not know that their heart has become so hardened. But God is going to require their blood at his hands, and it's, it's a tragic thing. Um, I don't support the idea that we go and uh, murder an abortionist. I don't think that that brings glory to God at all. Uh, we should try to influence people's minds and through... Uh, political action, but to go and take their life into our own hands, I don't think God's pleased with that either. Um, number G, letter G, sacrifice of children is forbidden. Psalm 106, they sacrifice their sons and their daughters to demons. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was desecrated by their blood. Now, 
if you remember what was going on with that, the demon gods and their priests taught the people that the way to uh, control the demons, the way to protect yourself self from demons, was to sacrifice what was closest to you, what was most significant to you. And they literally would sacrifice their children on the arms of these false gods. Um, these gods, some of them were made of brass and were larger than life size with the arms out like this. And they would set fires inside the, the statue of the idol so that the metal became white hot. And they would lay the baby on the arms and literally just fry this child at that moment. I think, can you imagine hearing the screams of these children and thinking that you are pleasing God, pleasing any God, pleasing demons? I mean, it's just, it's incomprehensible to me what people will do to serve their so-called gods. So he warns us about that and then talks about the punishment for causing an abortion in Exodus 21. If men are fighting, who are fighting, hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there's no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the husband's uh, demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you're to take life for life. Do you know what I think that means? I think that means that no serious injury, the baby survives after she's struck, but the baby survives. There's no serious injury. But if there is a serious injury, you're to take life for life. If the mother dies, his life is to be taken. I take it further. If the baby dies, he's to be executed as well. And uh, some certainly would not agree with me on that, but that's why I'm not a judge. Deuteronomy 27, cursed is a man who accepts a bribe to kill an innocent person. Then all the people shall say, Amen. What could be more innocent than this baby? And what could be more of a bribe than to pay these doctors to kill the child? I think that's a perfect application. Cursed is a man who accepts payment to kill an innocent person. So there are other verses as well. And there are other resources here uh, that you can look at. But there are books that Marla has mentioned already that uh, deal with these issues. And uh, if, if you come into a time where you need to counsel someone, if, uh, if you can't find a book on it, we'll be glad to find it for you so you can do some research. If you're going to counsel someone about this, uh, we hope to be developing a counseling library as time goes further. But uh, we certainly, even, even before that time, if you need a resource, we'll try to help you find it. Comments or questions? Yes, Bob? Could you do a segment on on adoption, certainly. Yeah. I think following this would be. I think that's a very good idea to talk about adoption. That's one of the options that uh, a woman who is going to have a child but is feels incapable of supporting the child or feels that she would not make a good mother, rather than killing the baby, uh, put the child up for adoption. There are those who are willing and anxious to find a a child to to raise. Uh, sometimes the adoption homes are are not good, and that's a tragedy. But still, you know, it's it's worthwhile looking into and trying to have some involvement with it. It was real sad when we were going through the adoption process for our kids. I don't remember which one it was. We're talking for some of it. Um, there was a couple there, and she had had an abortion. And that was the only child she was going to have. So they were trying to adopt because she could no longer yeah. get pregnant because of the damage. Mm -hmm. So it is tragic, sad. isn't it? Mm -hmm. It really is. But I'm so thankful that there are people like you folk who have adopted. That is a, a very important decision and it's a sacrifice. And uh, know your story and, and the extreme sacrifices you've made in regard to that. And I just commend you for that. I think that's an awesome thing to do. And I, Bob, I appreciate your suggestion that we'll try to keep that in mind. I think that's a really good topic. Anybody else, comments or questions? We're, we're gonna uh, put off the study of 
uh, post-abortion until next week. We have the, the notes ready. We'll get those to you next week. But um, I, I want us to think in terms of what, how do we help a young lady uh, or an older lady who maybe has not dealt with her abortion? How do we help them? How do we help to comfort them? How do we help them to see the love of Jesus? Um, some feel like, well, we need to, we need to, uh, they need to suffer greatly because of what they've done. And, and I contend that they've already suffered greatly. What they need to do is to find the love of Christ and to know that he cares for them and to know that we as children of God, we care for them and we recognize that we're all sinners, every one of us. There's not one of us that can stand before God in pride and say, uh, like the Pharisee, Lord, I think I'm not like this guy over here. You know, uh, we need to just be the kind of people say, oh, God, that you would love me in spite of my sin, that you would accept me as your child in spite of my sin, that you would send the Holy Spirit to live in my heart in spite of my sinfulness. Oh, God, how glorious that is. We need to be healers as much as possible. And that's, if you would be praying for our counseling ministry as, as God allows it to develop, we would pray that people would begin to know that, that we're here to help, that we're not here to condemn. Uh, we're straightforward with them. You know, we will share some things that they need to hear. But we try to share it with gentleness and love rather than condemnation. And to, isn't that a glorious verse? There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I mean, I just look at that. I think that's awesome. That's a fabulous verse to teach people. So we're going to go through some of those things next week. And uh, then we'll keep it a little bit shorter tonight, as we should. But uh, we'll pick this up next week. Anything else before we close with prayer? Lord, we're so grateful that you love us and that you have forgiven us. We do not deserve your forgiveness at all, but Lord Jesus, you died on the cross to pay for our sins. Oh, what a, an amazing thought that is, that you cared enough to die for us and that you rose from the dead to guarantee eternal life to all who would believe. I pray, Father, you'd bless this church. Help us, we try to reach out to others in our communities around about, that they would come to know you as Savior, that we would love them into the kingdom. Father, may we as your children be joyful, cheerful representatives of the kingdom of God. May they find that there is, is a loving spirit and a welcoming spirit. May people who need the Savior, may those who need counsel and who are heartbroken and troubled, may they find that they can come and find some relief. And I pray, Lord, you bless this ministry and all the ministries of Tri-City. And we'll thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. God bless you. I so appreciate you being here with us. If you have any questions, we're trying to deal on any suggestions, by the way, like about adoption as a topic. Other topics that you'd like to see covered as we come into the summer, pastors ask that we continue this class through the summer. Um, willing to do that. So uh, if you have some ideas of things you'd like to uh, to study, uh, in, along with counseling, you know, some of it may be peripheral to counseling, but we'd be glad to, to do those. Okay. All right. God bless you all.